This is Ernest Hilbert, and I will be reading from the Telemachus chapter. Happy early Bloomsday to everyone, and thanks to Ed Pettit, as always, and to Derek and everyone else at the Rosenbach for putting this together. So uh, here's from the Telemachus chapter. Haynes, from the corner where he was nodding easily a scarf about the loose collar of his tennis shirt, spoke. I intend to make a collection of your sayings, if you will let me. Speaking to me, they wash and tub and scrub, agonbite of inwit, conscience. Yet here's a spot. That one about the cracked looking-glass of a servant being the symbol of Irish art is deuced good. Buck Mulligan kicked Stephen's foot under the table and said with warmth of tone, Wait till you hear him on Hamlet, Haynes. Well, I mean it, Haynes said, still speaking to Stephen. I was just thinking of it when that poor old creature came in. Would I make any money by it? Stephen asked. Haynes laughed as he took his soft gray hat from the holdfast of the hammock, said, I don't know, I'm sure. He strolled out to the doorway. Buck Mulligan bent across to Stephen and said with coarse vigor, You put your hoof in it now. What did you say that for? Well, Stephen said, the problem is to get money. From whom? From the milkwoman or from him? It's a toss-up, I think. I blow him out about you, Buck Mulligan said, and then you come along with your lousy leer and your gloomy Jesuit jibes. I see little hope, Stephen said, from her or from him. Buck Mulligan sighed tragically and laid his hand on Stephen's arm. From me, Kinch, he said. In a suddenly changed tone, he added, to tell you the God's truth, I think you're right. Damn all else they are good for. Why don't you play them as I do? To hell with all of them. Let us get out of the kip. He stood up, gravely ungirdled, and disrobed himself of his gown, saying resignedly, Mulligan is stripped of his garments. He emptied his pockets on the table. There's your snot rag, he said. And putting on his stiff collar and rebellious tie, he spoke to them, chiding them, and to his dangling watch chain. His hands plunged and rummaged in his trunk while he called for a clean handkerchief. God, we'll simply have to dress the character. I want puce gloves and green boots. Contradiction? Do I contradict myself? Very well, then. I contradict myself. Mercurial Malachi, a limp black missile, flew out of his talking hands. And there's your Latin Quarter hat, he said. Stephen picked it up and put it on. Haynes called to them from the doorway. Are you coming, you fellows? I'm ready, Buck Mulligan answered, going toward the door. Come out, Kinch. You have eaten all we have left, I suppose. Resigned, he passed out with grave words and gait, saying, Well nigh with sorrow, and going forth, he met Butterly. Stephen, taking his ash plant from its leaning place, followed them out, and, as they went down the ladder, pulled to the slow iron door and locked it. He put the huge key in his inner pocket. At the foot of the ladder, Buck Mulligan asked, did you bring the key? I have it, Stephen said, preceding them. He walked on. Behind him he heard Buck Mulligan club with his heavy bath towel the leader shoots of ferns or grasses. Down, sir! How dare you, sir! Haynes asked, Do you pay rent for this tower? Twelve quid, Buck Mulligan said. To the Secretary of State for War, Stephen added over his shoulder. They halted while Haynes surveyed the tower and said at last, Rather bleak in wintertime, I should say. 
Martello, you call it? Billy Pitt had them built, Buck Mulligan said, when the French were on the sea, but ours is the Omphalos. What is your idea of Hamlet? Haynes asked Stephen. No, no, Buck Mulligan shouted in pain. I'm not equal to Thomas Aquinas and the 55 reasons he has made out to prop it up. Wait till I have a few pints in me first. He turned to Stephen, saying, as he pulled down neatly the peaks of his primrose waistcoat. You couldn't manage it under three pints, Kinch, could you? It has waited so long, Stephen said listlessly. It can wait longer. You pique my curiosity, Haynes said amiably. Is it some paradox? Pooh, Buck Mulligan said. We have grown out of wild and paradoxes. It's quite simple. He proves his algebra that Hamlet's, he proves by algebra that Hamlet's grandson is Shakespeare's grandfather and that he himself is the ghost of his own father. What? Haynes said, beginning to point at Stephen. He himself? Buck Mulligan slung his towel stolewise across his neck, bending in loose laughter, said in Stephen's ear, O oh, shade of Kinch the Elder, Jaffet in search of a father. We're always tired in the morning, Stephen said to Haynes, and it is rather long to tell. Buck Mulligan, walking forward again, raised his hands. The sacred pint alone can unbind the tongue of Daedalus, he said. I mean to say, Haynes explained to Stephen as they followed, this tower and these cliffs here remind me somehow of Elsinore, that beetles o'er his base into the sea, isn't it? Buck Mulligan turned suddenly for an instant towards Stephen, but did not speak. In the bright, silent instant, Stephen saw his own image in cheap, dusty mourning between their grey attires. It's a wonderful tale, Haynes said, bringing them to halt again. Eyes pale as the sea, the wind had freshened, paler, firm and prudent. The sea's ruler, he gazed southward over the bay, empty save for the smoke plume of the mailboat, vague on the bright skyline, and a tail, a sail, tacking by the Muglins. I read a theological interpretation of it somewhere, he said, bemused. The father and the son idea, the son striving to be atoned with the father. Buck Mulligan at once put on a blithe, broadly smiling face. He looked at them. His well-shaped mouth opened happily, his eyes, from which he had suddenly withdrawn all shrewd sense, blinking with mad gaiety. He moved a doll's head to and fro the brims of his Panama hat quivering, and began to chant in a quiet, happy, foolish voice. I'm the queerest young fellow that you ever heard. My mother's a Jew, my father's a bird. With Joseph the Joiner I cannot agree, so here's to disciples and Calvary. He held up a forefinger of warning. If anyone thinks I'm not divine, He'll get no free drinks when I'm making the wine, but have to drink water and wish it were plain that I make when wine becomes water again. He tugged swiftly at Stephen's ash plan in farewell, and, running forward to a brow of the cliff, fluttered his hands at his sides like fins or wings of one about to rise in the air, and chanted, Goodbye for now, write down all I said, and tell Tom, Dick, and Harry I rose from the dead, What's bred in the bone cannot fail me to fly, and all of that's breezy. Goodbye now, goodbye. He capered before them down towards the forty-foot hole, fluttering his wing-like hands, leaping nimbly, Mercury's hat quivering in the fresh wind that bore back to them his brief, bird-sweet cries. Haynes, who had been laughing guardedly, walked on beside Stephen and said, we oughtn't to laugh, I suppose. He's rather blasphemous. 
I'm not a believer myself, that is to say. Still, his gaiety takes the harm out of it somehow, doesn't it? What did he call it? Joseph the Joiner? The Ballad of Joking Jesus, Stephen answered. Oh, Haynes said. You've heard it before? Three times a day, after meals, Stephen said dryly. You're not a believer, are you? Haynes asked. I mean, a believer in the narrow sense of the word, creation from nothing and miracles and a personal God. There's only one sense of the word, it seems to me, Stephen said. Happy Bloomsday. Bye-bye.